Uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation and uh, for uh, having me here. And it seems that according to some of my respected colleagues, my main task now is to keep everybody awake, which I will try, but I'm not sure whether I will succeed or not. So in request, uh, in response to Marie Paul's uh, uh, kind demand that I should introduce myself, that's me uh, before falling. And uh, that's my university. We are now, I think, the second largest in the Iberian Peninsula after merging the uh, classical with the technical. That's my own page. And um, rest assured, I'm not going to talk anything about sketching because that has amply been covered in the morning sessions. I'm going to talk more about something that Marie Paul explicitly asked me to talk about, which is multimodal interfaces for shape exploration. And so, since we were talking about this over lunch, amazingly, yes, there is a Ivan Sutherland sketch pad, and I, I just put this here, it's a short one minute clip because it was something that inspired me many years ago. Actually, if I had the sound on, you could hear Alan Kay say that uh, this was 25 years ago, which means that this rendition of Alan Kay's of uh, Ivan Sutherland's is already also a little bit dated, but it's amazing what you can do with a personal computer, even one that costs about 10 million and has a whooping a uh, couple of K of memory. And uh, what, why, do, why are we all here? Because we think, as C.A. or Hoare like to say, that uh, this kind of interface for 40 years was not only a great improvement over its predecessors, but also over most of its successors. We are now over the curve. And so, we are not going to, I'm not going to talk about Sketchpad, because this is strictly 2D, and we've seen the future, and of course the future, uh, it's not what it's been cracked up to be earlier. Uh, you remember this uh, kind of movie, so the, f the future also gets old. But what do we mean by natural interfaces? Well, certainly a combination of speech, gestures, and maybe some very sexy high-hand displays, and uh, we've all been to Hollywood. I cannot show the movies, of course, for copyright reasons. But there is this idea that sort of pervades our visions of what the immediate future will be. And it, there's a table, there's some kind of holographic displays, and that's not just Hollywood. Many other companies bill it to us as such that you will be able to speak, do gestures, have a speech recognition work wonders for you, and in some due time, interact with holographic displays. Why did I picture the person uh, with a, uh, uh, their mouth covered? Because we know that speech interfaces will still be the future a couple of years from now. And of course, there is the famous Bruce Brannett movie that sort of motivated us all, in which Bruce just does a whole virtual world in under 59 minutes uh, single-handed in one-to-one -one scale. Uh, we might get back to that. But so. What am I going to tell you about? So we're sure, unlike all the previous uh, uh, presentations this morning, I am in the now for something different mode for you Python fans out there in the audience. And uh, most of the stuff about sketching was still on doing things that uh, go back to the old uh, pen and pencil metaphor uh, paper and pencil metaphor of yonder. And my motivation is to go beyond that. And to go beyond that, I'm going to show you about six pieces of this vision. So space, the idea is to explore the space above the table or whatever two-dimensional surface interacting with. And of course, you want to go the old uh, one-handed uh, uh, problem by uh, doing bimanual interactions. You want to touch the third dimension. And when it comes to modes, you could exploit sound in not so obvious ways. And I have something to tell about um, uh, shape strip. And maybe you guys get to kick me out if I get to speak for too long. So that's why I let kicking for last. And um, so come to think of it, the hollow table comes with this third dimension. And uh, several years ago, we wanted to exploit that and see how we can combine the touch surface 
and in what ways we can exploit the space above the table. And we came up with uh, four different ways. So, of course, we know that uh, the, the, the nice uh, uh, thing about uh, interactive surfaces is that you can do two-handed manipulations, and this feels like the ultimate the Shangri-La of uh, direct manipulation, as Ben Schneiderman would have it, and that you can navigate in video timelines, uh, do page turning, and directly manipulate things, and this is all physics uh, does uh, right. So, how do you integrate the space above the table with direct touch? So we, we argue that the gestures above the table could then complement and uh, direct touch on the surface in some nice ways. One of them is that you can extend reach. You no longer are confined to where your arms uh, are able to get you, but you can point that stuff out there. So that's the first thing that uh, uh, using the space above the table buys you from a strictly um, HCI. Uh, um, HDI perspective. Another thing that you can do is mirror gestures. What does this mean? Essentially, you can do everything that you can do on the table. You can also do above the table. So you can do page turning as well. You can repeat most direct manipulation things without getting your uh, or the surface of the table greasy. And of course, then the nice thing about using uh, above the table gestures versus direct touch is that you can reach to things that are out there. So first advantage, you can do that. And of course, this movie uh, has a certain dated feeling about it, and I will wonder if anybody knows why that is. Okay, I'll let that be, but um, the idea is that y you could this was usually done uh, before the Kinect era, but still, when you use a Vicon, you can afford yourself greater precision and the figures are not shaking. So that's one advantage of things. So you can increase the precision, increase your reach, and um, you can do more complex interactions. Of course, instead of doing rotations with two hands, you can do rotations with a single hand because the posture can be recognized as another element. And so, that's about the full scope of the paper. And next, we wanted to do, to figure out, so how, what do we get if we integrate that idea of uh, going beyond two hands, or going one, beyond one hand and going into two hands? Uh, what can that get you in terms of graphical interaction? So we took Ryan Schmidt's program uh, shape shop and did a two by manual version of it and the idea was to explore the interaction space here so the key points here is that table architecture uh, is key to this you can combine pen and gestures and you can use a, a nice French result by a guy called Guillard who developed this two-handed asymmetric model and uh, one thing why we, uh, we do like uh, about this research is that if you use more contexts, and that's one of the things that I want to talk about you about in this, uh, in this talk, you will get less cumbersome uh, interaction. And one uh, nice thing about using a model that tells you uh, that you're using two hands is that you can associate certain modes to the right hand and certain modes to the left hand. And what Giar told us in the uh, 1980s was that people tend to use both hands differently when it comes to drawing. He did, study, he did a psychological study of people drawing sketches, and he noticed that people use the dominant hand, be it the left or the right one, to draw. And they would use the non-dominant hand to do ancillary tasks such as uh, uh, flipping pages, uh, moving stuff around, changing the notebook position, etc. So we decided to do that. And the question is, how can you tell whether a person that's operating with a table, a touch table, is holding a drawing pen in the right hand or the left hand? So you, how can you af avoid having to know whether a person is left-handed or right-handed? 
And so the question is, how do you know what's the right hand? Or the left hand, what's the dominant hand? And the, the, the question is easy, it's usually, for me, the right hand, that's where the one I use for doing precision tasks. So we figured out, if you use two different lasers on a table that uses uh, uh, laser, um, infrared lasers, if we use a different color of infrared, we could detect automatically which hand was the dominant hand. That would be the one holding the pointer. Very natural, and that's the one key point about uh, this work. So it is the table, it's kind of a large table. So what we did was taking a felt pen, normally one, and replace the tip by an infrared LED, and then we would have a matching camera uh, with a matching infrared filter inside the table so that you could judge by the color of the blob whether it was the pointer you were holding or whether you were doing manipulations, and presto. The only nice thing about this is that you don't need to have a separate drawing and manipulation modes because your hand becomes your mode. If it's a dominant hand, you're drawing. If it's a non-dominant hand, you're uh, moving stuff. You are manipulating the camera. You are doing ancillary stuff. And that increases greatly the fluidity of interaction. Uh, Don Norman uh, uh, talked about and still talks about this idea of the articulation gap and uh, the conceptual gap. The articulation gap is knowing that you know what the command is in the interface, but you have to dig down in the menu to activate that mode. So one of our Shangri Las is if you want to make user interfaces for modeling seem natural, you want to get rid of extra modes. And that's the one thing that Kiar uh, model affords you, it gets you rid of spurious uh, modes by just figuring naturally what role is reserved uh, to each hand. And so you can sketch and manipulate objects using both hands without menus, which is good. And uh, so for those of you who don't know Shape Shop, it combines uh, two of the nicest or nastiest, depending on your beliefs, things in computer graphics. Uh, uh, which is uh, CSG and implicit surfaces. And so you can have the best or the not so good, uh, the, uh, the worst of both. And notice here that people tend to, um, to tend uh, naturally to take advantage of um, either mode. So that was the paper. What did, we did a couple of user studies. I, I cannot bother you too much with details, but this is expected. What did we find out? That the nature of the task did change from when you used just one hand, which was the traditional version of the interface, to when you used both hands, you tend to do less camera movements and you do, tend to do more sketching. Unfortunately, we could not do anything about title. So uh, maybe there is further research somewhere hidden here and behind what you can do with 40% of the time that you're modeling. And people did like the pen, the prefer the, uh, the, the combined technique. The, everybody thought it was the best, that it would allow more fluid interaction, less physically demanding, less stressful. And the interesting thing that we found out was that uh, Guillard was not entirely right because people do not always do camera manipulations with the non-dominant hand and sketching with the dominant hand. They will do camera manipulations with the dominant hand if they feel that precision is required. So actually, a little change of uh, the um, Guiara symmetric model is that precision tasks, which include drawing and precision manipulations, actually are candidates, good candidates for handling with the uh, dominant hand. Okay, so getting these things together, we come to um, maybe some kind of Bruce Brannitz-esque uh, version of uh, manipulation. So we try to combine two uh, handed models with, um, um, or with uh, manipulations on and above the table. So we call this the continuous interaction space. And now we have a small problem. We have to precisely track four things. 
we have to know where the head of the person is. Now, this is cool research because we're using Kinect just to know where the head of the person is. So we can actually use active stereo to get an idea that you're manipulating 3D stuff above the table. So you have active structure glasses and you can project at 120 times per second to get you 60 hertz stereoscopic view. You have a multi-touch table with a 3D projector. Well, uh, and the Kinect wouldn't do for tracking hands. Why? Because the Kinect is very imprecise. At that range, you've got an error like this. And if you want to give people the impression that they're actually touching solid stuff above the table, it has to register. And it cannot register with the Kinect. So, but mind you, given Moore's law, we will have cheap cameras that will capture frames like at uh, 16K or 4 times 16K uh, resolution in 10 years, and that will give you the position of this finger 120 times per second with one millimeter precision. Right now, you have about 164, no, less than 164. You have about uh, 1 to 150th of that, or even less because of the resolution of the Kinect. So we went for a thing called game track. I don't know if anybody here ever heard or experienced them. Thank you, Ken. So uh, we managed to buy these uh, on eBay for cheap. And the nice thing about game track, mind you, we are playing a scenario here, right? So 10 years from now, we will have this resolution without wires. Everybody knows that the future will be wireless and we want to go with the flow, except that the present is not. So at present, we can get from this uh, device, we can know the length of this thread to within one millimeter, like 120 times per second, and it's good old-fashioned technology plus uh, sturdy wires. And we had another problem. We could not detect the pinch gesture, which is useful for many of the modeling operations we have here. And so we, we had two switches. That's so, so, okay, so we cheated a little bit, but mind you, it's for a good cause. It's for the scenario. And so now we have an interesting user model. We have to tell person, a person, we have to tell the system now, because we are not using active uh, uh, finger tracking, whether the user is left or right-handed. So in certain ways, this feels like a step backwards over our previous work. But we get to know who the active user is, where they have their head, uh, where their hands are thanks to the Kinect, so you know if a hand comes close to the table, you can show up a context menu. And you know whether a finger touches the table, and you have four fingers tracked in space thanks to game tracks, so you get events like finger X from end Y on or above the surface from user Z. And now you can do interesting things. So you can use the same equation that allows you to use modes uh, and replace hands for modes. And you can do movement in sketching in one uh, integrated operation. And nicely above that, you can manipulate things above the surface. You can do extrusions with continuous gestures starting from the surface. You can also do extrusions on uh, up in the mid hair, or you can do some fancy uh, operations. And the other thing interesting here is that you know that when the non-dominant hand touches the table, you get context menus. And when it's the dominant hand touching the object on the table, it selects. You can select an object, and you can perform asymmetric things. So without further ado, it's a video. using gestures on or above the surface. We designed the user interface to let people interact with objects as if they were real. Our setup combines a multi-touch surface with a 3D projector for stereoscopic visualization. And we use a Kinect camera and two game tracks instrumented with a button to track user gestures on and above the surface. Using the different types of input, we are able to identify which hand fingers belong to or continue tracking fingers as they move between surface and free space.
While interacting on the surface, users can sketch using the dominant hand or manipulate shapes with the non-dominant hand without needing any explicit mode selection. Sketch recognition is used to recognize simple shapes and beautification is performed to adjust line and curve drawings. Using existing content, users can create complex shapes with multiple strokes or use both hands to define a symmetrical axis. And this is another interesting example of two-handed interaction where it can, which you can achieve continuously without, invo uh, without involving any kind when of... When interacting of above the surface, users can move or extrude shapes along their normal using the dominant hand. And here's an example shapes can also be extruded along curve gestures to create freeform shapes. Faces can be cut to add details, and extrusion can be done continuously from sketches. While the dominant hand is used to sketch or model, the non-dominant hand can be used to define constraints for the dominant hand. Or, it can be used to present a contextual menu following the hand to select operations or modes such as copy. And that's totally Menus can also be used for continuous gestures to complement a modeling operation such as scaling while extruding an object. As on the surface, the non-dominant hand can be used to move objects in space to stack them. It can also be used to control the orientation and scale using both hands to better explore or manipulate the shape. Shapes can be snapped according to a plane. This makes it easy to switch between free space and surface for sketching on a face. We now illustrate Mockup Builder with four scenarios. Okay, uh, so that was a demo, and uh, let me quickly run to three or four uh, interesting issues. We did some uh, user tests with this, and we found out that people tend to prefer to work in God mode, and not unlike uh, Bruce Brannett uh, suggests in one-to-one -one mode. So whereas they dominate the virtual space and they work on a scale, people did like the simple operators and dialogues, and there's something nice about the um, uh, two-ended model in which you can um, 
operate on two degrees of freedom simultaneously with uh, both hands. And you notice that on constraint setting and also on uh, zooming or uh, extrusions and scaling that take place at the same time. And the idea that you can use the non-dominant hand to introduce constraints to make a symmetrical uh, figure drawing easier. And then there was this nice thing about the continuous transition between the space on the table and the space above the table and the use of asymmetric bimanual modes. Some of the reviewers complained to us that we were not really using a purely asymmetric bimanual mode and that this uh, was in violation of uh, certain laws. The fact that you could draw or scale an object with the both hands at the same time. So we did do a little uh, foray into object manipulation and try to figure out for this kind of manipulation above the table, what kind of operations do work best? And we tried to look at uh, uh, related literature, balloon selection, triangle cursors, uh, where people can select and manipulate the cursor in, uh, using uh, two fingers to define the base of a triangle, and the height is uh, based on the third vertex, is defined by the distance between those uh, two touches, or the last two touches. Another thing is touchio, which has a, uh, a nine degree of freedom uh, uh, um, user interface for stereoscopic visualization. We have Holodesk and other things such as media interactions. Although they did not uh, use really uh, stereoscopic displays, uh, they, uh, Helix and colleagues present a uh, technique to seamlessly switch between interactions on the tabletop and above it, which is something that we like it, using position in 3D of the user's hand uh, and a shadow for feedback. And last, we had uh, tried the handlebar primitive, uh, interaction primitive, where people can actually pretend there is a handlebar between the two hands, so all interactions, translation, rotate, and scale are two-handed um, handed with the two hands, so we can define the middle of the handlebar to define the translate action, and similarly to have the handlebar define the axis of rotation. And of course, everybody remembers the nice uh, paper about the color glove, which was a little bit intrusive, but it allowed people for having precise finger and then post tracking. And we used a variant of uh, the Akimbo Kinect to track both uh, fingers above the table for this purpose. Notice that we were not looking for precise manipulations, but rather to see how people could accomplish rotation, translation, and scale tasks uh, effectively. This is our familiar setup. And here's an example of uh, spatial uh, interactions when you use uh, the bimanual and the dominant hand to use one hand to select and uh, uh, to move the object. And then you have the sixth degree of freedom to, make, uh, to mimic interactions with physical objects. Um, where you use one single hand to define rotation in uh, manipulation across, um, along three axes. And we also tried uh, separating the degrees of freedom from uh, rotations from the non-dominant hand to translations to the dominant hand. And there is an example of uh, uh, this technique where you use the, uh, the non-dominant hand to rotate and the dominant hand to translate. And Last, we adapted the uh, TRS technique to the third dimension, which was uh, developed by Bruno uh, that I was in uh, Mockup Builder. In our version of uh, Mockup Builder is an example of the two-handed interaction, where you can use the two hands to define rotation, scale, and translation. And finally, the handlebar technique, where you use both hands and to manipulate an imaginary handlebar and that in turn uh, manipulates the object. And then we had another uh, interaction technique that we borrow from Martin Hachet's Tachio, which we have two touch widgets on the surface and uh, we can uh, use a balloon metaphor for height manipulation. It's an, it's an example of touching, uh, uh, so using the uh, widget uh, operation to manipulate scale rotation translation. So we did an evaluation of this uh, using the same apparatus with 12 participants and we gave them this kind of scenario to train and then very simple tasks, translation, translation and scale and translation rotate and scale. 
we found out, in, not so surprisingly, that more or less all techniques did fare well regarding the translation task, but the handlebar was very good when you wanted to scale and translate this object to fit it into the peg. It performed significantly better than the other techniques, and for the complete task, the six degree of freedom and the handlebar perform equally well. So people found out that the three degree of freedom separation for each hand was uh, made it difficult to rotate. Not unsurprisingly, they were using the non-dominant hand to rotate. They really liked the six degree of freedom hand, which would provide the smoothest and also the more fun to use. Again, some problems that when you use the six degree of freedom map to one hand, you get an intended object rotation, so you need to work that out a little bit uh, better. But everybody liked the mid-air techniques as opposition to ones that involving manipulating the table. And the other thing we observed is, in defense of our using the above the table and uh, uh, stereoscopic displays, is that people did use perspective. So they would get around and check whether the object was actually uh, were in the position that they intended to. So that's what I mean by people using perspective. And so this is one part of our work. The other part is really touching the third dimension. You would say, well, right. Uh, the bad part about that, and I've been lectured and I've been observed that, is that you cannot really sketch in three dimensions because you don't have any constraints. So people don't like sketching on thin hair. Uh, that's sort of an article of fate. Uh, because it will uh, uh, not allow them the kind of precision they want. And so for precision work, we did try a different thing. So suppose you want to manipulate uh, surfaces using a stereoscopic display, and our proxy was a tape. So Buxton had come up with these shape tapes for input, and we thought, Maybe we can use this for shape exploration. So the idea is that you interact with the, with the strip as a proxy of a spline on the object that you want to uh, sense or manipulate. You can use robotic arms to position the strip and orient it where you want it. You match that strip to a feature in the model. And here you see a video of someone using this. So we did use two robotic arms to, for precise positioning of the strip. And you could operate the strip by moving the handles or uh, by pushing it uh, gently uh, any other part. And you notice that each, the strip behaves in a sense like a spline where you have the mechanical constraints on curvature being imposed by the material itself. And you have a bunch of electric motors to shape it to the desired curvature. And you can use this kind of interaction technique to feel the surface along the curve. So the idea here is that um, the strip conforms to inter intersection between the object that you're trying to explore, the shape, and the cutting plane. So you have a virtual strip that matches that proxy. And then you can adjust the spline to it, assuming that's a continuous surface, and you can get haptic information and sound. Now let me see if that plays. And of course, if you run into discontinuities, you have to run into iconic sound. And uh, here is the um, uh, idea. You can deform the shape to follow strip. And if you want, you can also interact, uh, uh, interact with the, the shape by bending and twisting uh, the strip by pulling or pushing at its extremities. So this gives you a better feeling of things that are on 3D space. And you can actually feel shapes in a way as if they were solid. Of course, the problem here is that this is a continuous spline. Aptics has to be done. We have to resort to iconic sounds when you want to uh, transmit information that's not continuously mapping to the shape of the strip. And of course, the issue of the workspace, you're limited to whatever uh, the length of the strip you shows. We use the 60 centimeter strip with uh, six motors. Maybe you could use more motors uh, with some uh, more uh, del uh, delving into technology. I have two more things to show you. And the other thing is that you in the pre... 
Okay. In the previous slide, you saw sound using as an output uh, mode. Here, the idea is to use sound as an input mode. So instead of just touching the surface, you can actually discover which part is touching it and what intensity, so you can extend the interaction space and get tangibles for free. Let me show you what that means. So use an acoustic uh, contact microphone on that table, and this is kind of an affordable pet. Augmenting surface touch interaction through acoustic sensing relies on capturing the sound of user touches with a contact microphone. Spectral signature is displayed on top and amplitude envelope is displayed below. So this is the same table again with the... Unwanted noise, surface. such as the hum of the display projector, can be filtered out. The surface is sensitive to touch using a laser light plane technology to capture the blobs. In our prototype, different gestures display a unique spectral signature. Thus, other objects can be distinguished from hand gestures. you can distinguish between different ways of touching the table by special signatures. And so you can extend your command language. Now we provide multiple examples where screen. surface interaction can benefit from our sonically enhanced touch. We can simplify touch interfaces by reducing or eliminating graphical user interface elements and replace them with gestures. In this case, the user can clone photographs by pointing to desired photo and knocking to accomplish the clone action. Even application scenarios with a high number of actions can be addressed. In this case, the user can move, scale and rotate with the conventional lexicon and use sound gestures to slap to create groups, tap with the fingernail to explore groups and punch to delete objects. So as you can see, you get further modes and further commands from a basic touch vocabulary with uh, Gesture intention can be detected by amplitude analysis. And you can In this example, the stronger the gesture, the more scattered the objects become. Another common design issue in interactive surfaces is content orientation. In this example, the users are organizing photographs, but they are required to orient the content manually. Our approach extends gestures towards the outside of the tabletop, allowing the users to knock on the casing and send the photos to the other side. Here we can see how the user knocks the side of the table to send information to the other side. Acoustic sensing also provides a simple mechanism for detecting everyday objects without recurring to optical tracking. In this example, once the object hits the table, the photos are grouped and stored within the physical object. Multiple objects are supported as long as objects portray a different spectral signature. Once the object is placed on the table again, the corresponding photos are placed on the surface. So here you can distinguish the objects just because of the sound they make when they're... Furthermore, everyday objects can be used outside the touch area. Here, we show how three simple objects have a different audible signature. Thus, we can identify objects using only their sound. We present a touch application that recognizes pen, fingers, and tangible objects. By tapping inside each tangible, the user changes the pen color. Drawing only takes place once the pen is recognized and is distinguished from fingers through spectral signature. The position of the objects does not affect recognition. Finally, finger or whole hand gestures can erase the drawing.
So I I can continue this last video or I can answer questions. Your choice. Large-scale displays are great, but reaching down to grab objects isn't comfortable. Let's kick it! We propose foot input to simplify interaction with the bottom of the display and demonstrate how to leverage input from both the hands and feet. We present three regions, hands, foot tapping, and foot gesturing. Foot gestures are detected using a connect camera aimed at the user's feet. Our recognizer detects feet positions and looks for gestures close to the display. Here you can see the recognizer draw a red circle based on the position and orientation of the foot under the display. We demonstrate three foot gestures, toe lift, foot pull, and foot slide. Users can toe lift to temporarily raise objects, foot pull to delete objects, and foot slide to move objects. Touch is sensed using a laser light plane setup. Microphones are mounted at each of the four corners to allow us to classify finger or foot touches based on their acoustic signatures. Users can kick objects to raise them to eye level facilitating interaction with objects at the bottom of the display. Kicks can be combined with finger touches to move an object directly to a desired position, eliminating the need to reach down. We believe that foot input will allow millions of interactive pixels the world over located just out of reach of interacting hands to finally reach their potential for direct touch input. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, some uh, take home messages and uh, maybe one question. Thank you. Thank you.